volunteers here at Quest. Welcome to our online experience. I'm so glad that you guys took the time to join us today and I hope you're staying happy, healthy, and safe in your homes. We just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have continued giving even in these challenging times. Your giving has enabled the church to continue its work of reaching out to people in need. And for those of you who want to give, all our giving details are online at give.questcebu.com. 
Last week, we started with an interesting new series called It's Fine with Pastor Clay Scroggins. We are going to continue that this week, and it's all about healthy emotional habits. Did you know that it's very important to maintain our emotional hygiene just as much as we need to take care of our physical hygiene? It's all about building positive habits that strengthen our emotional health. Well, let's learn more about it. Here's Pastor Clay with part two of It's Fine. We're going to be all right. Are you okay? All right, guys. I love you. Bye, Bye, Mom. Have fun. Bye, Mama. Bye, Mommy. It's going to be fine. It's gonna be fine. It's fine. It's probably fine. It's gonna be fine. How? How'd it go? It was fine. So I remember the first time I was rejected by a girl. Hi, I'm Ben, by the way. So I'm sure I had been rejected times before, but this was like the first one that planted itself into my memory bank. Uh, let me give you a little background first. Uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, I went to a private Christian school. And anybody go to a private school growing up? Yeah, see, now we know who the weird people are, right? <laughs> and whether you went to a Christian school or a Catholic school or just a good old fashioned, super expensive private school, you know, it doesn't matter. You know you're weird, okay? Well, seventh grade, my mom decided to switch me to public school which was different. I was like, Mom, I learned some new words today, you know? <laughs> but I thought public school was awesome. We had gym class. We had an actual gym. We had lenient dress codes, Belle Biv DeVoe dance parties. I was like, man, I love this place. And there was a girl at my new public middle school named Karen, and she was magical. She had curly hair, and colored braces, and she wore guest jeans. And that's when my geometry took off, because I studied the triangle. Some of you, it's only funny if you're old enough to remember when guest jeans were cool, but I thought that she and I were a match made in heaven. We were more like a mismatch. She was about five inches taller than me. It was still like, three or four years before I discovered this thing called puberty. But uh, I had my own private phone with uh, my own private phone line, and she did too, which was amazing. Like I said, a match made in early 90s heaven. Uh, and we would just talk on the phone. We would log in hours each week of talking on the phone, which I know sounds horrible to most of you, but to me back then, it was amazing. And one night, I decided that I wanted Karen and I to phone talk our way out of the friend zone. And I was gonna ask her to be my girlfriend. And after numerous self-talks, self-pep talks, that's exactly what I did. Hashtag make a move. <laughs> Insert nervous face emoji, you know? <laughs> and I don't remember exactly what I said. Uh, all I know is that I put myself out there on my end of my private phone. And on the other end was silence. Like, is she thinking about it? Like, just so excited she can't talk. <laughs> like, you know, working through the perfect response. Is she alive? <laughs> she hang up? I don't know. Nope. She was in the seventh grade. Like me. And so she was putting her seventh grade mind and emotions to work, which, by the way, are not good relationship resources. And she said, and I quote, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. We have a bad connection. I gotta go. And then she hung up. And I just sat there in silence, in the dark, just to be dramatic, <laughs> for what seemed like 
100 years. And I'm totally confused, but also wondering if my phone has a loose plug in somewhere. And after all this time, I finally carried myself to bed and she was never my girlfriend. We never talked about it again and I will forever label my first rejection in two words, bad connection. (laughs) So I'm 40 years old now. I still don't know how to emotionally process what happened that night. Like these days, my therapist has much bigger fish to fry. Right, if we're gonna go that, we're gonna go back into childhood, we're gonna deal with like daddy issues and you know, faulty core beliefs. We're not gonna talk about my private phone, middle school crush rejection. I was, I mean, you don't talk about it as a 13 year old. You don't cry about it as an adult. It's fine. You just laugh about it. And then you look her up on Facebook. (laughs) And you pray that she's living a below average life. And if those prayers are answered, you take screenshots (laughs) and you text them to your friends and family to throw shade at a girl who had the audacity to create literal audible static on a phone call 27 years ago. (sighs) Okay, I think I'm done. All y'all can invoice me for this therapy session. Thank you and goodbye. Oh, can anybody relate to that? <laughs> I, I, I don't have a story like that. Uh, but, but I do have areas of my life that uh, I, I try to avoid. Uh, I have areas of my life that I try not to talk about. I have areas of my life, even today, that if you were to ask me, what, 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 what was that like? What was that about? I would say, I, it, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, it, it's fine is usually reserved for those moments in our life when we don't want to talk about whatever it is that someone's asking about. Maybe someone has recently asked you about what your childhood was like, about what your first marriage was like, maybe about what your first job was like, or about how you're doing now. How's everything going now? And and maybe you've answered with those words, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, I've learned to live. I've learned to cope with it. I've learned, I've learned to get over it. I've learned to somehow move past it, but I wouldn't say that I have dealt with it. it, it it's just, it's fine. All of us have stuff like that in our life is what I have discovered. I've discovered that this is not unique to any one of us, but it's actually the thing that joins us all is we all have, uh, how do we say it? Unprocessed emotions. We all have feelings in our life that we don't know what to do with. And so this series is really all about the dangers of using the words, it's fine. It's about the freedom that can come from actually experiencing emotional uh, hygiene or emotional health in the same way that we have physical hygiene, in the same way that you, you would prescribe to other people a healthy way of eating or uh, healthy dental practices or healthy physical practices. W- what if we also spent some time thinking about, well, what are the emotional habits that we have in life? We've defined hygiene real simply as this. You probably don't need anyone to define it, but it's the practices that keep you healthy. What are the practices that you have that keep you healthy? I mean, in the same way that we've got brushing your teeth or flossing, where where are those in here that floss on a regular basis? Would you be willing to admit it? Great, you are the healthy ones in here. What about the ones that the only time you floss is when you're about to go to the dentist? Anyone else? Yeah, that's pretty much me. In the same way that dental hygiene or physical hygiene or some sort of healthy hygiene involves brushing or flossing, emotional hygiene refers to being mindful of our psychological health, to be more healthy psychologically. What what, what What are the habits that we have for our mind? What are the habits that we try to keep for our mind? We all know that if we were to neglect things physically, the implications, the consequences would be profound. Well, what if the same thing is true? What if we were to neglect things emotionally? I I saw a statistic recently that said that unaddressed loneliness had just as profound implications as smoking. But we, we don't think about that. We don't pay attention to, do I have unaddressed loneliness? In fact, it's kind of taboo to even admit that. 
It's, it's something that no one walks around proud of. It's something that we would label as, well, you're just weak. You just need to get over it, particularly for those of you of the male species. Females, yeah, in general, stereotypically, are a little more open to talking about feelings, a little bit more in touch with emotions. But as we said last week, one of the challenges of being a guy is that maybe for all of your life you've been told, well, man up. You, you, you shouldn't feel those kinds of emotions. You just got to get over it. That's for the weak. That's for the, the, the ones that are sissies. No, no, no. You should just man up and power through. But maybe the most heroic thing we could do with our emotions is not just to push past them and to get over them. Maybe there's something that actually would benefit us to turning around, to looking into us, to lean into what am I actually feeling? What am I experiencing? So, so the question we posed last week, a very simple question, but I hope to be a question that all of us would experience some progress in, what, what would change in our lives if we spent as much time on our emotional hygiene as we did on our physical hygiene? What would change in our life? The same time you spend getting ready every day, the same time you spend showering and brushing your teeth and doing the things to stay physically healthy, what would change if you spent that same amount of time on your emotional hygiene? Maybe the same amount of energy, maybe the same amount of effort. As we talked about last week, some of those emotions that are inside of us, uh, being curious of them is one of the best things we can do. Because until we actually find language for them, I've, I've found we just remain stuck. See, our emotions, they actually enslave us until we find the language to let them out. Our emotions enslave us. They keep us locked up. They keep us stuck until we find words on how to communicate what we're actually feeling. That's the simple, the simple application from last week was just to be curious about what you're actually experiencing. Be curious about what's actually in there and to expand our vocabulary so that we recognize that there are more words for our emotions than just happy or mad, right? So last week, uh, we, we offered this deliverable product in PDF form, which you can get on our website or you can get on our social media. Uh, it, it's a feelings wheel. This is something that I have to do because I'm not the most emotionally in tune person. Though I grew up with sisters, an older sister and a younger sister, and uh, can find my way around a shopping mall, I'm not that adept in identifying what I'm actually feeling. And I recognize that my marriage would get better, that my relationship with my kids would get better, that I would, I would actually improve as an employee if I was more able to explain what I'm actually experiencing. So if you zoom in, there's just some some simple words to put language to what we're actually feeling. That it's not just all happy or angry. You know, there's way more than that. And for you to grow as a human, for you to grow as a person, for me to grow as a person, is contingent upon our ability to know what we're actually feeling, to, to be able to know what to do with that emotion, to be able to anticipate what others may be feeling, what other emotions may actually be experienced, and then to know how to respond appropriately. My, my, my hope for this series, my hope is that this would actually bring about change in all of us, that it would help us in profound ways, that maybe it would make you a better dad, maybe it would make you a better friend, maybe it would make you a better employee or a better manager, or a better leader, maybe it would help you in your relationships with your coworkers. The truth is 90% of your ability to, to, to grow professionally 90% of your upward mobility professionally is dependent upon your emotional health. So I hope that this series allows us all to grow as people, to get better as people. I, I, I'm assuming the fact that you're here, the fact that you're watching, the fact that you're listening explains to at least some level that you want to get better, that you want to grow. The hard part, though, is that too often for us to grow, for us to get better, it requires change. Uh, in preparation for the series, I was rereading a book that I read a couple of years ago. It's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's by a guy named Peter Schizero. It's a terrific book, and in the book, there's this quote that I thought was just excellent. The sad reality is that most of us will never go forward until the pain of staying where we are is unbearable. The sad reality is that most of us won't move forward until the pain of where we are is so profound that we don't know what else to do. So would you have the courage, would you have the, the bravery to actually look inside, to expand your vocabulary, and then to begin to adopt some behaviors, some habits 
that would help you grow, that would help you begin to grow, not just physically, but to grow emotionally. Most of us tend to neglect those positive habits or behaviors. Most of us tend to pretend that they're not there. Most of us neglect positive habits or behaviors that will strengthen our emotional health. Why? Why do we neglect them or why do we avoid them? Well, because they're not easy, right? I, may, maybe you would say, well, I don't know what I'm going to find. If I actually looked back into my childhood, if I look back into my relationship with my parents, or if I look back into that first marriage or the, the job situation that seemed to be a failure, if I look inside of it, maybe there's some fear because you don't know what you're going to find. Or maybe it feels, well, it's just so complex. I don't know that I have the skills to be able to work through a situation like this. Maybe you would say, well, it just takes a lot of effort, and I just feel more apathetic. I just don't want to. Or maybe you found it's just easier to pretend. And I'm not saying every time we use the words, it's fine that we're pretending. No, sometimes it's fine is what you're actually experiencing. Our, our five-year-old daughter said this to me the other night when I asked her about a situation at school. She just said, it's fine. I, I, I've got a, a five-year-old daughter named Sally, and she's by far my favorite of our children. Um, so I, I said that earlier today, and somebody said, are your other kids, are their feelings going to be hurt that you said that? Um, and I said, are you assuming that my kids watch me preach? Do your kids listen to you talk? Yeah, well, just apply the same thing. Of course they don't watch me preach. So no, they're never going to be offended. They're not going to hear this. But if they were to hear this, I would say, I'm just kidding. She's not really my favorite. All of our kids are our favorite, except for her. She's definitely our favorite. So we have a nine, a seven, a five, a three, and a one-year-old. So we've got a lot going on at our house. We keep it lit, if you will, and I do hope you will. So I'm putting our five-year-old to bed the other night. Her name's Sally. She just started kindergarten. She's been in kindergarten for about a month now. And I went to the curriculum night at the school, and the teacher was explaining the dollar system that the class has adopted. It's a way to encourage positive behavior. She says, when a child does something good, I give them a dollar. But then she said something that I hadn't really thought about. She said, when a child does something that we wish they wouldn't do, we, we take a dollar away from them. Now, I had asked her. I knew about the dollar system. I heard about it every week because on Friday, if you have $10, you can get a toy out of the treasure box. This is what our five-year-old lives for. And so I, you know, on a regular basis, I had asked her, hey, did you get a dollar today? Anything good happen? Anybody give you anything for doing something that you, you know, are proud of? And when our teacher mentioned that they take dollars away, I thought I should probably ask her if she ever had a dollar taken away. And so that night as I was putting her to bed, I asked her, I said, Sally, have you ever had a dollar taken away? And she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've learned as a parent, you just try to poke her face, you know, and try to act, you know, like you're not surprised. Like, of course you have, you know. Uh, our other children would have never had that happen, but with you, okay. So I say, tell me more about that. When did this happen? She's like, well, it actually happened last Friday. She said it was just before Treasure Box. She said I was talking to my friend, and we hadn't finished our conversation yet. I could tell the teacher was looking, but I didn't really care because we weren't done yet. And so she said, hey, would you be quiet? And I just decided that I wanted to finish the conversation, and so I finished. <laughs> and so she took a dollar away from me. So I asked her, I said, well, that, did that bother you? She said, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm, you, you can be honest, though. I mean, do you feel some shame? Do you feel some regret? Do you feel guilty about this? And she's like, no, no, no. She said, I had $11, and it only took 10 to get one, and so I knew I had one to spare. It was one of those, like, uh, it was one of those situations like an anchor man when he comes home and he's talking to the dog and the dog had gotten into the fridge, you know, and he was like, I'm, I'm not even mad, I'm impressed, you know? That's kind of what I said. I'm like, listen, listen uh, well, you should probably, if the teacher's looking at you and asking you to stop talking, you should stop, but uh, I'm very impressed that you're doing the math and you knew you had one to give, like, <laughs> amazing, you know? It's going to help you a lot in life. It won't help you get good grades in conduct, but it will help you in life. But we all know that just because you use the language, it's fine, doesn't mean that there's always more there. And so I'm not, I'm not advocating for you going on some witch hunt, trying to figure out exactly what all is in there. No, I'm just saying, if you want to grow as a person, it's going to require you adopting habits. So the question really is, is why do we pretend? I mean, pretending, quite honestly, pretending feels safer than honesty and vulnerability, but it leaves us with a pretend version of ourselves. And so you can pretend if you want to. Maybe you've pretended for a long time, but maybe it's time for the sake of the people around you, for the sake of your own growth, maybe it's time to stop pretending and just to look back, to face into it, and to be honest about what's really going on. The question for today is really, what do emotionally healthy people know? And, and, and what do they do? What do emotionally healthy people do? Last week, I encouraged you to be curious. Emotionally healthy people know 
that there's usually more there. That it's fine is usually a sign to point to something more. It's fine is usually an excuse that we give to cover up for something that's really there. And picking up the rock sometimes is scary, but it's worth it. And then what do they do? What are the habits? If somebody were to ask you, what habits would you provide? What habits would you encourage to, ha to help someone have healthy physical hygiene? You know what you would tell them. But what, what, would, what would somebody who is emotionally healthy prescribe as habits that we should keep? With his followers, Jesus had conversations about habits a lot. In fact, maybe you've heard the phrase, uh, you're, you're going to eventually reap what you sow. Well, that's something that Jesus talked about with his followers, that he knew, hey, this is the way life works, that when you sow something, you will eventually reap something, that there is a cause and effect to life. It's one of the realities of life. And in this conversation that we're going to look at real quickly, Jesus introduces this conversation with his followers, his closest followers, explaining to them, urging them, begging them, challenging them to pay attention to what they're sowing and what they're reaping. Because usually there's a correlation, and it all has to do with our habits. The habits we keep is ultimately going to determine the kind of life that we have. This is found in John 4. If you have a Bible, you can turn there, or if you have a Bible app, you can go there on your app, or we're going to put it up here on this screen. But here, here's the way it begins. It begins this way, John 4, verse 31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, urged him, Rabbi, eat something. This is the end of a long day. And what they're prescribing is they're prescribing healthy physical hygiene. They're saying, hey, Jesus, if you don't eat something, you're not going to have energy. Healthy, a healthy diet is essential to healthy hygiene, right? It's a practice that we keep to maintain health. Jesus says, though, I, I'm not talking, I, I, I have something more in mind than just healthy physical hygiene. He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. I've got food to eat that you don't know anything about. All of your energy is going toward physical hygiene. I want to introduce you to another area of life. I've got stuff that I'm worried about that you're not worried about. Stuff I'm thinking about that you're not thinking about. There are things that I'm working on that you're not even working on, and I want to invite you to pay attention to something more than just food. Now, I love how honest this conversation is because uh, it would be if we were there as well. These disciples were thrown off. They didn't know where he was going. Jesus was always on another level. And in this case, we actually get to see how slow on the uptick they actually were. This confused them. His disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? Well, <laughs> what happened? Did somebody make a Taco Bell run and they didn't, and we didn't know about it? I mean, what, what is he talking about? I've got food that you know nothing about. You, you know how the feeling, right? When it's lunchtime at work and somebody comes back with a big bag because they take, take everybody, everyone else's order and they forgot to ask you. That's probably what they're thinking. They're thinking, did somebody run out and get some food and we didn't know anything about this? Hey, ask us next time. Okay, we're interested. They couldn't figure it out. So Jesus has to uh, explain. He dumbs it down. He says, let me explain to you what I'm talking about. He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. More important than food is to have a clear connection with my Father in heaven. More important than food is to know exactly what God wants for me, to know exactly what he has for me, to be able to see clearly, to be able to move from a cloudy sense of vision to a clear sense of vision. When I read this, I thought about a simple uh, illustration that uh, for those of you that ever played uh, the, not, not the Atari, but the, the gaming system just after that, which was the, the Nintendo. Yeah, do you remember the way the Nintendo worked? Uh, this is a Nintendo game. Uh, this was actually Super Nintendo. Um, I saw this lady over here. You were already doing it. That's amazing. Um, this is a Super Nintendo game, but it worked just the same. Uh, it's amazing the way, the way the gaming system worked. Uh, there was never a manual for this. As far as I know, Nintendo never prescribed this. But everyone knew that in order to have a clear connection with the unit, something needed to happen, right? If you put the game in and all of a sudden there was a little bit of fuzz on the screen, something wasn't operating correctly, what would you need to do? You would need to blow into the game. Everyone knew this. Like a harmonica, you would go... And then sure enough, you put the game back into the unit and it would work perfectly. It's unbelievable how well that worked. Now, some of you could probably explain why that worked. I don't want to know, all right? I just want to be left to my own imagination. It was just magic. It was some sort of connection between my breath and this game that allowed it to work. But we all know that's not true. 
In the same way, Jesus is advocating for a healthy connection between him and his father. I, I, the best thing that could happen to me is not a full stomach. Though that's important for healthy physical hygiene. And if you never had a full stomach, then you wouldn't eventually live. That, yeah, that's a big part of life. But as long as I don't have a connection with him, there's something I'm missing out on. And so there are some things that need to happen for me to have a clear connection with him. And he's going to explain the idea of habits, the idea of sowing and reaping. He continues and he says, don't, don't you have a saying, oh, it's still four months until harvest. Well, I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Don't you have this saying? Hey, harvest is still four months away. You've got plenty of time. This is the way I lived my entire academic life. The semester would begin. My parents would always tell me, hey, why don't you go ahead and start looking out over the semester at what you have to work on? But in my mind, I would say the same thing. I would say, yeah, but we still have four months. Why would I start reading anything now? Why would I start writing anything now? Why would I start studying anything now? We've still got four months. We have plenty of time. Jesus is saying, don't you usually procrastinate about important things in life? When it comes to your physical hygiene, you think, oh, well, I've got plenty of time. I can work out later. In the same way, there are going to be areas of your life where you say, you know what? I just don't want to do that work because it feels hard. It feels complex. I don't exactly know what I would do. And so I'm just going to put it off. He says, don't, don't, don't do that because the fields are ripe right now. What you're doing now matters. As now, so then. The habits that you keep will eventually determine what you reap. The habits that you keep, the habits that you have, will determine what you reap in your life. Jesus says this is so obviously true. Why would it not be true with your emotional health, with your psychological health? So he continues to explain. He says, even now the one who reaps draws a wage and the one who harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Now, clearly the topic of this conversation is around eternal life, is around what the life that we can have both in this life, but also the next life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have more life, that you might have a, a better life, a greater life. I'm talking on the spiritual realm, that there's, there is a way in which you can experience something greater. And it's not just because something you have sown. No, it's something that you can reap because someone else has done the work. In a spiritual sense, Jesus is speaking of his own sacrifice. I am going to make a sacrifice on the cross. I'm going to sow something on the cross, and you have the potential to reap it. You can reap something that you didn't sow. You can sow something that someone else can reap. But the big idea is that we're all connected. That if it's true that I have reaped something that someone else has sowed, the, 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 the scary part, the, the, the reality of the conversation is that someone else is going to reap what you sow. And, and you can wait, and you can put it off, and you can kick the can down the road, and you can say, well, there's still four more months until harvest. Or you can just admit, no, I'm going to start because problems that happen later usually become greater. I'm going to start because the people around me are affected by what I sow in the same way that others got to reap from what Jesus sowed. He, he says, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps. It's true. It's true that there is a connection between us. So he says, in, in, in conclusion, he says, I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. So would you pay attention? Would you pay attention to what you're sowing? Because you're getting to reap eternal life and you didn't even do the work for it. You're, you're affected by someone else. And in the same way, someone else is going to be affected by you. Who, who's affected by the things that you sow? Well, it's your coworkers. It's your boss. It's your family. It's your friends. It's those closest to you. The big idea is that we're all connected. 
and the habits that I keep for myself, they will eventually affect the people that I love most. You, you, you will reap the habits that you keep. Not, not only you will reap the habits that you keep, not only will you, will you get to the benefit from the, the effort you put into it, but others will reap from the emotional habits you sow as well. You will get to experience the benefit from the habits that you begin, from the habits that you keep. But the truth is, other people around you will as well. So I told you my hope is that you would be encouraged, that you would be motivated, that maybe you would be inspired, not by me, but by what Jesus has taught, that, hey, we're, we're connected, that what you sow eventually turns into what you reap, and what you sow eventually affects what other people get to reap. But my hope would be that you would decide to establish some new habits. All of our lives are just summed up by the habits that we keep. The life that you have right now, you have that life because you chose to have that life. With, with, with a, a number of exceptions, but for the most part, the quality of your life is dependent on the habits that you've established and that you've kept. And, 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 the, and the habits that people around you have established and kept. So, so what should we do? What, what are the emotional habits that healthy people do? What are the emotionally hygienic things that healthy people do? I want to give you just a couple. There, there's a dozen. There's 20. There's 40. There's 50. We could all name a bunch of them. I'm going to give you just a few of them, and I would love you to just pick out a couple. Maybe you don't pick out these. Maybe you pick out your own. But I would love it if you would, because of today, establish some new habits with the belief that I will reap the emotional habits that I sow and others will reap from the emotional habits that I sow. Here's the first one. The first one is this. Would you let your feelings in the car, but make sure to not let them drive? Would you, would you, would you, be, would you be open enough to let them in the car? It, it's dangerous to mask them. It's dangerous to pretend they're not there. It's dangerous to just try to muscle up and get past them but it's equally dangerous to put them in the driver's seat and to let them take you exactly where it is that you think they want to take you. Neither is a great option. So would you let them in the car, but not let them drive? That's really what we talked about last week. Would you be emotionally curious enough to know what they are, but then determine, based on what's going on in your life, based on what the people around you are telling you, would you then determine what, what should I do because of this emotion? What is this emotion encouraging me to do? Secondly, would you maintain an ongoing dialogue with healthy people? The truth is, in all of our lives, for us to become emotionally healthy people, we cannot do it alone. You cannot get to a place where you are trending or growing in emotional health without people around you. This is the way God created us. So would you be willing to maintain a dialogue with healthy people? Some of you have a dialogue with unhealthy people. So you know how to maintain a dialogue. Would you just somehow figure out a way to surround yourself with some healthy people? In our church, uh, we call this small group. This is really what small group is. We, we say all the time that circles are better than rows. That Yeah, rows have a value, but greater than the value of the row is the value of the circle. Because content, information is worthless if it's not put into practice. And sitting in circles where you get a chance to talk about it, where you get a chance to listen to other people's experience, where you get a chance for other people to refine what you actually think about it, that's where growth actually takes place. I can't imagine where I would be in life if it weren't for the groups that I have been in, if it weren't for the group that I'm currently in. I have been shaped more by those people than just about any other relationship in my life. And there are plenty of people that could also agree. So would you choose to somehow maintain a dialogue with healthy people? This, this season right now, at least for North Point, I can't speak for every church that's with us today, but at least for North Point, we're launching some brand new short-term groups. They're topically driven on your way out today. We're going to hand you a card, and it's got all of the topics on there. And if you've never experienced a group, this is a great place to start because they're short-term. They're, they're maybe four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, but it's not this uh, maybe daunting year or two-year commitment. So I would love to encourage you to maybe uh, investigate it, maybe pay attention to it. On our website, you can find out all the information for it, but again, we'll hand you something on your way out today. 
But number two, would you maintain a hel- uh, an ongoing dialogue with healthy people? And then number three, would you choose to prioritize the feedback from others over your own assessment? You, you know this, right? That we are all biased to think that we are right. All of us are. <clears throat> We're all biased to think that the way I see the world is the right way to see the world. For me, it shows up most in the way I vacation with my wife. I want to get to the airport as soon as they make the last call to get, on the run, to get out there onto the plane. My wife wants to get there an hour and a half early, give us a chance to do a couple laps around the mall, have a couple conversations, make a couple phone calls for me. It's all wasted time. I want the door to goose me onto the runway. (laughs) But you see, I see it different than she sees it. And naturally, I think the way I see it is right, and she thinks the way she sees it is right, and so we go with her plan, not mine. (laughs) That's a healthy marriage, right? But would you choose to prioritize the feedback of other people above your own? Uh, A couple of years ago, Jeff Henderson, uh, the lead pastor at Gwinnett Church, introduced this question to our our whole organization. I believe he preached it uh, in a sermon on a, on a, a Sunday a couple of years ago. The question goes like this, what is it like to be on the other side of me? Why is that question important? Why is that question valuable? Because you've never sat on the other side of you. You, you, you've only sat on your side of the booth. And it's valuable, even if you determine it's wrong, to at least ask the question, what's it like to sit on the other side? How does that question feel? To me, it's an incredibly scary question. Because I might get some information or some feedback that doesn't feel good. But the The idea that I've seen so many healthy people do is to prioritize that feedback above their own assessment. I know the way I see it. Help me to see how you see it. And I'm going to choose to believe that there's value in the way you see it. When everyone else around me says that I should change, it's still easier for me to remain the same and and to believe that they're all wrong. It's the amazing thing about the way life works. So healthy people choose to prioritize the feedback above their own assessment. I'm telling you, if you would be willing to do that, it would allow you to grow. It's a a habit of emotionally healthy people. And then lastly, number four, would you be willing to invite God into the process? We're going to talk about this next week because this to me is the X factor. Everything else is worth doing. Everything else is great. I would encourage you to try it. Be more emotionally curious. Pay attention to it. Expand your vocabulary. Establish some new habits. But ultimately, until we invite our Heavenly Father into the process, there's only so much that can be accomplished that He is actually the X factor. And in His kindness, and in His love, and in His grace, and in His mercy, He allows us to invite Him in. And when he comes in, he doesn't come in like a bull in a china shop. No, he comes in like a surgeon, a well-skilled surgeon that's paying attention to the pain, that's delicate and careful with the wounds, but is ultimately looking out for our best interests. So don't miss next week. The big idea for today is just this, that failing to establish healthy emotional habits will ultimately undermine the relationships that you care most about. When you fail to establish healthy emotional habits, it will eventually show up in the relationships around you. If you want to be a better coworker, I'm telling you, you've got to have some healthy emotional habits. If you want to be a better dad, if you want to get to know your kid's heart, you've got to establish some new habits. If you want to be a better spouse, not just a spouse that's there, but a spouse that says, he really knows me, she really knows me, you've got to establish some healthy habits. So I pray that we'll do this. I pray that we'll do it all, maybe even together, maybe in some of our groups together. And as we do, I really believe that this is a way for every one of us to grow into the likeness of who God wants us to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, 
I know this is scary. I know for some people it's even foreign. I know for some people they even want to write it off and go, ah, that just feels like just pop psychology. But God, I deeply believe that you have made us as emotional beings, that we're not just a physical body, but you've given us a heart, you've given us a soul, you've given us emotions. And when we start to grow, everyone around us, everyone around us wins. God, thank you for the way that Jesus modeled this for us. That he was so in tune to the way people around him felt. That he was in tune to the way he felt. And I pray that we would have the same kind of honesty and vulnerability. And as we do, I pray that you would allow us to grow. That you would allow us to experience the kind of life that you designed us for. I pray that you would convince every single one of us that we cannot do this alone that it's only through the help of others and it's only through the help of you that we're going to experience this kind of growth. Thank you for Jesus. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. I hope that you guys learned a lot because I certainly did. We're going to be posting some discussion questions right after this. So feel free to utilize that to continue the discussion with your small groups, your friends, or your family. Anyway, Please do join us next Sunday for our in-person service. It's going to be really fun. We hope that you would come and worship with us. We're going to continue with part three or the conclusion of It's Fine. So see you then. Take care and God bless.